do you think uh, the uh, foreign investors uh, in this process? How do I think? Foreign investors. Foreign Foreign Now or before? Before. Uh, during the Sadat time or the Mubarak time? Six years. The, the, the 60 years, okay. Oh, so you're talking about the, the, let's say, the power structure in the world and its influence on Egypt. Yes. Okay. Number one, um, the time of Nasser, when the military, we call it the 1952 revolution, but I call it the military in 1952, okay? And when it happened, uh, Nasser um, had two choices to stick to the eastern camp or the western camp. He tried the western camp, okay? But then the Americans began to refuse a lot of things, particularly with the story of the high dam, okay? The World Bank did not want to fund, and, and so he diverted his attention to the Russians, to the other camp. Remember at that time, after the Second World War, we had you know, the Cold War and the two camps and all that. So he went to the Eastern camp. And that is why life in, inside Egypt, plus all the foreign um, relations of Egypt, were taking the leftist side, okay? We have the non-allied uh, uh, Congress that he began with, with with India and Czechoslovakia, and um, sorry, uh, Yugoslavia, and, uh, and uh, uh, the the fact that uh, he was supporting all the uh, liberation movements in Africa and in, in the Arab world, and and the fact that he was a revolutionary in that sense because he was he was sort of. I don't want to say it like that because it's not really like that, but uh, let's say metaphorically, like a tool of the coming turn, sort of. You know what I mean? In that sense. And because he was, he belonged to the Eastern camp. Come Sadat, it was different. And so what did Sadat do? He tried to go to the, to make the shift to the Western camp. And so he went to the Americans. Now in order to go to the Americans, he had to resolve the issue inside Egypt. Remember, a lot of people in Egypt were uh, leftists, communists, okay, and they did not believe in uh, right-wing politics or in capitalism. So what did Saddam do to resolve this issue internally? He, he made a huge mistake, okay, from which we are suffering now, and I think we will continue to suffer, and that is he opened up the prisons for the Muslim Brotherhood, he let them out, he let out the extreme Islamists to combat the communists inside Egypt through universities and university students. So to make the shift he had to get rid of the leftists. To get rid of the leftists he brought the extreme right wing Islamists into society. After a while when they started you know wanting a piece of the cake he crushed them and put them in prison. And they killed him. Okay? With, when Mubarak came, Mubarak, um, okay, Mubarak was a very uh, stubborn man as a person. He's very, he was very, very stubborn. He was not as charismatic as Nasser or as intelligent as Sadat. Okay? He was he's a, he's an army officer. He follows rules and that's it. And he will not accept any opposition. This is his. This is his character. So, not being extremely bright, okay, uh, he took the the easy way out. And the easy way out is to stick to the people who are going to give him financial aid to feed the ever increasing population. He did not think that it would be a lot better to develop the country. But, you know, so he took the Western camp side. You have to remember that after the Camp David Treaty and after the 
end of the Arab-Israeli conflict with, between the, the, the Egyptian-Israeli conflict and the Camp David Treaty. We have not had any wars. We are getting a lot of uh, uh, aid money for the military from the United States. We're getting a lot of money from USAID for a lot of projects. And in spite of what anybody might say, I have to admit that in the past 30 years, a lot of wrong has been done. He is really responsible for a lot of wrong things, but at the same time, the country moved a little bit forward economically, better than before, and a lot of things were done. I mean, we have to be fair here. We can't just say that the man was really bad. But this is how we move back and forth. And basically, in the meantime, uh, the dissolution of the Soviet Union happened, and the, you know you no longer have the two camps. So now you either follow the United States or you don't follow the United States. So you don't have much choice. Okay. Go on then. Okay. The revolution happened. Okay, and. Uh, the forces of change came from the young people. But the forces of change that came from the young people had a base. Egyptian opposition had been growing over the years. There was the, um, uh, the, uh, the Democratic Front for Change, the movement of Kifaya, and all those people were going out on the streets already before the 20th of January. But it was the young people who brought everyone together. And it happened. Of course, using the social media was uh, one way of doing that. Okay. The revolution was such a wonderful, wonderful time. Everybody was watching on television. People were on the streets. Even the foreign media was, you, you know, everybody in the world was, you know, so excited watching. You know, what was happening, and it was hailed as a wonderful revolution, so peaceful, and it was, okay? And uh, I don't know if there are any Egyptians in this room. No. You were there at the time? Yeah, I, I spent the first 18 days at Tahrir Square. So you I left everything behind, you know, I was very close to this. Some of my friends were injured, some died, you know. I left my family behind, you know, though I'm the only breadwinner for my three children, you know, I'm having three children, I left them behind, and I don't know what might ha happen for them if I died. So, it was the desire to change. Yes, there was the desire to change, and it was so very sincere, so very honest. Everybody was part and parcel of that. People, of course, were afraid at home, and there were a lot of, of problems, and yet, everybody was calling for that, it was a great moment. But the revolution ended. And when the revolution ended, we all woke up to discover that we have a mess, a real mess. So when the revolution ended, the road to democracy was less smooth than Egyptians wanted it to be. And many problems started emerging. Now, we have colossal problems. We discovered colossal problems. The most important is the economic problem. And the economic problem is a very important problem because it affects everything else. Now, what happened was that after the revolution, uh, the call or people were chanting uh, bread, freedom, human di dignity, and social equity. Now, social equity and bread are not likely to happen soon. Okay? Because of economic problems we have. And I am not an economist, but I know for a fact that um, because of the freedom that we got, people are starting to speak up. They don't want what they're in, they want better living conditions, and 
the government can't provide it. And so the more they realize that this is not going to happen, they start demonstrating. And as they start demonstrating, they put the spoke in the wheel of production and, you know, we start losing money. Okay, the National Reserve has gone down. And, you know, demonstrations on the streets, stopping, you know, uh, work in, in factories, etc. Et it's, it's all pulling the economy down. And then, because, again, we are having ineffectual governance, okay, and very weak, very weak, successive govern governments, they are not able to address these issues, and so people are getting more and more frustrated and not going out to work, demonstrating, taking to the streets every other day. And this is going on and on, and so the economy is rapidly going down. But uh, with this, we also have a chaotic atmosphere. First, the haphazard demonstrations every other day, that's chaotic. But also, we have increased thuggery on the streets, lack of security, okay? Only, you remember, only three years ago, you can go home at 2 a.m. in the morning, on your own, walking on the street in Egypt, a woman, and nobody would come near you. And it was very, very safe, okay? Now, it's not safe. Okay, so we have security problems, increased thuggery, theft, okay, uh, the proliferation of firearms. We have serious problems, okay, and <clears throat> with it also we have a, st a general state of lawlessness, a uh, lack of discipline, um, um, disregard for law, and of course a huge or uh, um, a great laxity in law enforcement. The law is not being enforced, okay? So we have this horrible, chaotic atmosphere, which still exists until now. There are no police officers on the street. The police is not working on the street. They don't work on the street. They don't go to the streets. They don't get involved, okay? And when you ask, they tell you things like, oh, you know, because when we talk to people, people start screaming at us, at us and they mistreat us, and they, you know, they, they, don't, they disregard us. Well, that doesn't, I mean, I'm still paying you your salary. You have to work. This is not the case. This is not happening. So a general state of lawlessness. And then we have a legislative and political maker. Another form of chaos. Why? Because after the revolution happened, um, the normal process, I mean, for any normal country in, in the world, you would probably have a constitution, and then parliamentary elections, and then after parliamentary elections, you have presidential elections, and then move on. Now, we, we, you know, we just went like that. Okay? Why did we go like that? Because, because at the time, they said, hey, we're going to um, do the following. Now, after the, I did speaking after the revolution, we, we were working uh, um, under the constitution, the 1971 constitution. Now, with the revolution taking place, this constitution is announced. Now, the interesting, I want to point out something here that is very interesting. When the revolution happened, and Mubarak stepped down. Now, according to the Constitution, when he steps down, the Speaker of the House is the one who should take over. What did he do? He stepped down and he gave the power to SCAF, Supreme Council of Armed Forces, which is unconstitutional to start with. Okay? It's not constitutional. But the Egyptians were so happy, you know, we have, we have very short memories, okay? Uh, the Egyptians were so happy, so they started, you know, flapping their wings, you know, Mubarak is gone, Mubarak is gone, as if everything's gonna, you know, uh, be just great in a, in a day. And they, they forgot that this is unconstitutional, that the armed forces are taking control over the country. He gave something that he does not own to people who don't or cannot take control of it. So. Initially, it was all unconstitutional. 
Anyway, so Scaff took over and they said, okay, let's have a constitution or would you like to have parliamentary elections? Now, all the is Islamists, because they have a vested interest in getting to parliament, because they want to control legislation, they pushed for parliamentary elections. Okay? What happened was that they put this referendum. And they said, now after the revolution, Scaf was in charge. They had to talk to somebody. Remember, this revolution is no leader. It was the people. Okay? Who did they have to? They wanted to talk to somebody. Who went directly to them? The MBs, the Muslim Brotherhood, because they are an organized force. They have their own leadership, right? So they went off to speak with, with Scaf, and obviously they were the people who are going to be in charge. Although, they were not in the revolution from the very first day. But anyway, this is beside the point. So what happened is they put it all to a referendum. Do you people want a constitution first, or do you want parliamentary elections? Now, at that point in time, and that takes us back to the, the point that, um, uh, that you asked me about, how did the move east affect the culture? And I'll give you an example from this referendum. When people went to say yes or no in the referendum, the Islamists went to people and told them, if you say no to the referendum, which means no to, um, uh, to parliamentary elections first, you are going against the will of God. If you are a good Muslim, you will say, yes, we want parliamentary elections first. They bought their votes. Remember, you know, it's very, very easy to win the heart of a, of a poor person, a poor, illiterate person with a little bit of money or a little bit of food or whatever. And this is what happened. You go, and this is what they used all the time. If you want parliament, if you say uh, the constitution first, it means you are an infidel. You are going against the will of God. And so the result was, no, we go for parliamentary elections first. This, is, this was the result of the stupid referendum, which put actually the cart before the horse. And that is why we are in a mess. We have no constitution. We are now working with partly the 1971 constitution that was annulled and a new constitutional declaration that was issued by SCAF. So what we're doing is, we have a constitutional declaration, and then we refer sometimes to the 1971 constitution, and we don't have a constitution.